I've been listening to people sound the alarm about the demise of college football since the confetti dropped on Michigan's national championship win over Washington. You had Jim Harbaugh leave the Wolverines for the NFL. Nick Saban retired. Jeff Halfley left Boston College to become an NFL coordinator. And Chip Kelly left UCLA after trying to become a coordinator anywhere that anybody would take him only to end up at Ohio State in the vacant spot left by Bill O'Brien, who took over at Boston College. And people point to these things as evidence that the once great college football empire has started to crumble. But it only took two days for Alabama to replace Nick Saban with Washington's Kalen DeBoer. It only took two days for Washington to replace Kalen DeBoer with Arizona's Jed Fish. And it took a couple of days for Arizona to replace Jed Fish with San Jose State's Brent Brennan. The Boston College job was filled after one week. UCLA was filled by Deshaun Foster in less time than that. People are lining up out the door to have a crack at being a college football head coach. And that's not what a dead or dying sport looks like. That's because college football isn't dead. It's just changing. Is it a drastic change? Yeah, for sure. And there's nothing wrong with the coaches staring down these changes and saying, ah, that's not for me. Because in fact, it's refreshing. But I want to take a second to be intellectually honest about whether or not that that's actually what's taking place. Because Jim Harbaugh didn't leave Michigan because he hated the transfer portal, NIL, or player empowerment. He was actually doing the opposite. He was complaining constantly that college football wasn't changing fast enough and he wanted profit sharing. Nick Saban was the second oldest coach in the country behind Mac Brown. He would have been 73 heading into the SEC's annual November cupcakes, and he's not eternal. How many 73-year-olds do you know that are able to put in 15 hours a day for 11 months a year working around young people? And if you think that man lets societal changes dictate his decisions, explain how he won nine of his 11 SEC titles in the age of social media without ever being on social media. And don't get me started on Chip Kelly. He's a good dude and I like him and a good football coach. But it would be one thing if Chip Kelly had mastered college football prior to the transfer portal and NIL, but he's always done his own thing. But just because it got harder to operate outside the system doesn't mean that in Chip's case, the system was the problem. Because Chip was out here ignoring recruiting rankings, neglecting the Southern California talent pool, and hiring coordinators without the energy and appetite for selling UCLA's program. The energy was what they were missing. He was an innovator in college football. And because of that, he was always trying to ice skate uphill. And if it got too hard for him to keep his balance and be a contrarian, that's not a college football problem. That's a chip problem. And now the Jeff Halfley thing is alarming because logic tells you that if you're young, energetic, and have a high-paying head coaching job somewhere that you're starting to gain some traction at, taking a step back to become a coordinator sounds illogical, right? But the quality of life in the NFL is better than it is in college. And Halfley's camp said that for him, college football was becoming less and less about coaching players, and he wants to get back to that. And that's understandable, but one case doesn't make a trend. And even if it is the start of a trend of head coaches stepping down because they don't feel equipped to handle all the responsibilities of the new landscape, that's not a bad thing. We need their knowledge, but as fans, we don't want unqualified, unmotivated dudes hanging on for a check. I've never been a college football coach, but I have a lot of friends in the profession and respect the hell out of the grind that it takes to not only thrive as a developer, recruiter, and schemer, but also be open to all the changes taking place in the game. But I don't want to hear any of them complain now, not, not even one of them. When I've never heard any of them complain about the freedom of movement that has always been afforded to the coaches or the market value that helps them have access to salaries that most Americans will never see in their professions. And to the fans threatening to abandon the game that they once loved, do you not see the irony that the changes that are frustrating you and supposedly ruining college football are that the players have a fraction of the ability to act like their coaches now? Maybe the problem isn't the players having expanded rights. Maybe the problem is that the NCAA spent ways too long fighting against expanded rights and that they missed an opportunity to make football players employees of the university who are beholden to contracts and have protections that would allow coaches to get back to focusing on development. 
and protect players from coaches being able to push them into the portal instead of, you know, doing their jobs. And I'm not going to negate people's feelings or push them away from college football. Although, if you do pull a Jeff Halfley and you move on, you need to know the game will be fine without you. And what I'm trying to do here is point out that the sport you love is going through puberty. It's a little awkward right now. Covered in acne, it's moody, dramatic, wearing clothes once before they outgrow them. But this is all a natural metamorphosis. And because of the NCAA's artificial hormone suppression, I'd be even say that this is a case of late blooming. But college football will come out of this much, much stronger because the game is strong. And as long as the NCAA gets out of the way, players will be able to share in the profits their efforts generate. The television networks, apparel companies, and bowl sponsors eventually will take the burden off of fans for player compensation, as well as provide the Title IX funds that ensure a thriving existence of women's sports. The universities will then hire general managers in charge of talent acquisition and contract negotiations. And the coaches that aren't comfortable and insecure about what their players earn will have stuck around long enough to get back to what they wanted to do in the first place, which is coach football. Football. But maybe, maybe I'm just an optimist. Maybe the pessimists are right. And the NCAA deciding to force amateurism down our throats while the coaches, administrators, TV network executives, and corporate partners built generational wealth, then treated the players like cattle, and then bragged about trading office equipment for labor as a character building exercise. Was college football at its best? Or maybe, just maybe, some change in growing pains are a good thing. Let that sink in.